How you guys doing? I was trying to sneak out here before so I could skip the applause, <laughs> but you guys are too generous. You guys are so nice. Literally, this is the easiest place to speak at because <laughs> you guys are so awesome. Hey, how was the worship team? Weren't they great? I'm telling you. Hey, I love the 9 a.m., but there's something different about the 1045. I'm telling you, you guys are bringing it. <laughs> so if this is your service, you guys are bringing it. I'm telling you. Hey, I'm just kind of going to go right into it. I believe that the Lord has kind of downloaded this message for us, and I just want to I just want to go after it and, and do that. And every time, you know, as I'm like preparing this message and stuff, you know, anytime I like to speak or anytime I'm speaking, I kind of like to just ask the Lord for an encouraging word or a prophetic word for our church and for today, for this morning, because I don't know if you know this, but it's not an accident that you guys are sitting in the seats that you're sitting in, that you are here on purpose. Actually, if you're new, if it's your first time, can you just lift your hand up? If you're so bold, you don't have to. Okay, a few people. Yes, come on. Can we give it up for anyone that's new? We're so glad that you're here. Seriously, you are in the right place at the right time, and I believe that God is going to speak to you this morning. And so I believe, you know, that he's going to do incredible things. And so I want to give kind of this word. I was reading as I was praying this week, Psalm 19 kind of stood out to me. If you read Psalm 19, it's like one of the longest psalms. It's so long. Um, so I'm going to read the whole thing to you. I'm just kidding. I'm just going to read a few verses. Uh, verse 89, it says, Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. It's firmly fixed. It's not loose. It's not changing. It's not, uh, uh, it's not weak. It's firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. But your appointment, uh, by your appointment, sorry, they stand this day for all things are your servants. And I need someone to know, I feel like this is a word from God. I need someone to know today that you can have hope. This is for someone here. Someone is walking in here who has no hope. They, they, they're, they're coming in here. You feel defeated. You feel weakened. You feel like you're on your last leg. I need someone to know today that you can have hope because of this, because of this scripture. Because God is faithful. He's not distant. He's in the midst of what you're going through. He hasn't forgotten about you. He hasn't forsaken you. Someone today needs to know you can walk with authority and boldness filled with hope when the simple fact that God is faithful, that his, his word doesn't go on void, that he is firm. It literally says in this, in this scripture that it is firmly fixed in heaven. He's not shocked by the circumstance you're going through. He's not shocked by what's happening in your life. He is in complete control. Is that good news today? That's a word for someone. Be filled with hope. Come on, can we pray as we just get, get going? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that your presence is here already. We thank you that your presence is with us today. Lord, because we couldn't do it without it. Lord, your presence is everything. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We open up our hearts to you. We surrender to you. Speak to us in this time. Holy Spirit, speak through the word. Speak through this moment. We love you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, hey, I want to talk to you. I'm gonna go, we're going to the Old Testament. And usually when I like speak, I love to speak uh, uh, a story of Jesus because that's like the easiest. You know, Jesus is easy to preach on. But, you know, I felt like the Lord in the season that I'm in, that he was bringing up Joshua 6. And so we're going back to the Old Testament. So I need to give you a little backstory because I don't want to read a, like a book of the Bible to you. <laughs> so backstory is Israel was literally, uh, it, it, they were slaves in the land of Egypt. This man named Moses uh, is called to lead them out of the wilderness. This is like the spark note version. So you can go back and read it, but I'm giving you the abbreviation. Does anyone even know what spark notes is? Okay, there was a thing when I was in high school. I don't even know if it's still a thing. Uh, anyways, uh, so, <laughs> sidetrack, a uh, bird. <laughs> uh, anyways, so Israel is coming out of Egypt. They were enslaved. Moses is bringing them out, they, and, and, and they come out, and it's miraculous. And then they go into the season of testing and trial, so they're in the wilderness for 40 years. I was just in Florida a couple months, or a couple months, uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was on the beach 
beach just for two hours and I was dying. My lips were crusty, my back was burnt. I looked at my wife and I was like, we gotta go or I'm gonna die. These people were there for 40 years. <laughs> so they're going through this season of testing, this season of trial. And then at the end of this season, they arrive to the, the place that God promised them, the promised land. And Moses, he ends up dying and he passes on this leadership mantle to Joshua. And now it's Joshua who is leading these people. And so now that they're in this promised land, Joshua is tasked with basically conquering the, 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 the people of Canaan. And so the city, Jericho, is their first city to conquer. This is their first battle. This is their first step. And a little backstory to Canaan, you know, as I read the Old Testament, I can get caught up uh, into this thought of like, man, that's kind of cruel that if you read it, you know, God would just conquer a nation, that he would just conquer these people. But there's so much context. I can't even like, I can't even give you all the context and the heart motive behind the Lord, but it's literally the same motive. And it's the same motive of who he is today. It's, it's grace, it's love. And, and there's so much context, but the people of Canaan were actually really bad people. They actually worship demonic idols. It was embedded into their culture. It wasn't something they were dabbling in. It was something that was embedded into their culture. And then they actually had like sexual perversion. They had, uh, they would actually sacrifice kids, babies to their, to their gods. And, and, and this culture was just a part of them. And, and God didn't want that culture to seep into the, the people of Israel. He didn't want that to affect this holy people. And so the people of Israel arrive into Jericho. They see it. There's this huge wall. And it's important to know that this wall was built for one reason, and that was war. This wall was built to keep people out. That, this wall wasn't a multifunctioning wall. It surrounded the whole city and it was built to keep people out who weren't out. And so the people of Israel come to this, this place and they're ready to go. This is the first step into fulfilling what God has called them to do. And so we're gonna read in Joshua 6, uh, chapter Chapter six, uh, verse eight. And I probably won't read all of it because it's, I mean, it's a lot of scripture, but I wanna give you the backstory of what's happening because they're at Jericho. God gives Joshua instructions on how to conquer Jericho. And so Joshua is now with the people and now he's relaying those instructions. And that's where we pick up in verse eight. It says, when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets and the ark of the Lord Lord's covenant followed them. The, the armed guard marched ahead of the priest who blew the trumpets and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time, the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voice. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. So what's happening is God told them to, to march around the city for seven days once every day. So for six days, they march around it once. And then on the seventh day, he told them to march around it seven times. Does that make sense? So once a day, but on the seventh day, they got to do it seven times. <laughs> and so uh, Joshua is telling them, don't say anything. He's given them instructions. And then we're actually uh, going to skip down to verse, I'm sorry for the, uh, the media team. I'm, I'm, I'm probably throwing you for a loop. Uh, we're gonna skip down to verse 18. But keep away, so he's talking about once they conquer it, but keep away from the voted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by talking or by taking any of them. Otherwise you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into the treasury. Verse 20, here comes, here comes the breakthrough. When the trumpet sounds, the army shouted and the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged in and they took the city. I think it's important as we continue this talk to um, think of a Jericho in your life. We want to view the city of Jericho kind of as a metaphor, but we practically want to apply it to our lives or it's, it means nothing. So in your, in your notes, um, in your notes or whatever you're using to, to take notes, kind of put down, ask this question, what's my Jericho? What's my Jericho in this season? And it could be anything. It could be, what are you believing God to break through in? 
Like, are you believing for him? Is the Jericho this financial situa- situation? Is this, is this Jericho maybe healing? Maybe you need mental healing. Uh, uh, maybe you need physical healing. Uh, this Jericho could be anything. So in, in, your, in, your, in your mind right now, in your notes, what is that Jericho? Because it's important as we talk about this to know what that Jericho is. And, you know, as we talk about laps, for whatever reason, when I read this story, I just think of running. They're only walking, but I, you know, like anyone do like run laps in, in high school or something. Anyone, is there any runners in the room? Dude, no. Okay, me and you, man. All right, one guy. A few guys. Okay, so no one likes running. That's what I gather. Last service, everyone was like, no one likes running. Anyway, so I run from time to time. And every time I run, I, do, I don't go for distance. I go for time. So I run for 45 minutes. And every time that I run, exactly at the 35-minute point, I hit this wall. And that, when I hit this wall, I want to give up. I'm tired. My legs hurt. I'm just, it's hot. I'm just like, it's literally the mental battle starts playing in. And I just start kicking in. I'm like, dude, I do not want to do this. And I'm not like the most, ath- I'm actually not athletic at all. I almost said I'm not the most athletic, but I'm not athletic at all. But every time it happens, 35 minutes. And so I wanted to t- title this, this, this message, The Sixth Lap. And the subtitle is, It's Time for a Second Wind. And I think this is a timely word for, the, for our church, but for the church in general. We just came out of a season as a culture that was heavy, that is just complex, that is just wrapped up in so much mess. And I feel like sometimes we walk around defeated. I feel like sometimes the church can, can walk around and they just need a second win. So I'm here to tell you today, I hope this word is encouraging to you and you feel like you get a second win, like you're running out of here with the second win because the sixth lap is important. The sixth lap is so important. We're gonna unpack that right now. So point number one, we're gonna go into it. How you start matters, right? You have your Jericho in your mind. The thing you're believing God to break through in. How you start this thing matters. Verse eight, when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets, the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets and the ark of the Lord covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priest who blew the trumpets and the rear guard followed the ark. At this time, the trumpets were sounding. Verse 10, but Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voice, do not say the word until the day I tell you, then shout. Joshua had to say, wait, not yet, because you have to understand the people of Israel were coming out of a season of testing. They were amped up. They were in the promised land. They could see literally Jericho and the land of Canaan. They knew where they were at. They were probably Doped. They were probably ready to charge the wall. They had their machetes ready. I don't know if they had machetes, but it makes sense in my mind. Uh, but they had their weapons ready, and they were, they were going, they were ready. But Joshua knew before any of that, he said, he, he, man, he's such a good leader, right? Before any of that, he foresaw this thing, and he said, wait, not yet. God gave us instructions to do this and we must follow this because Joshua knew if we start this thing in disobedience, it will end in disobedience. And let me tell you something else. Disobedience is the fastest way for us to unalign with the will of God. The fastest, if you want to know if you're in the will of God or how far away from the will of God, you can look back at your track record of obedience and it will line right up. This is important. Joshua was trying to teach this culture like, hey, we have to obey the Lord. This obedience thing, it actually matters. This obedience thing, how we start this thing, it really matters. And what's crazy is like the people of Israel didn't have bad intentions, right? Like their intentions were, would have been good if they, if they were to charge in and do this thing. Their intentions were probably like, man, we're excited. We, we, we've seen God move. We heard tales of our grandparents of the Red Sea splitting. We know he's going to do something. They were probably full of faith. They were probably full of his presence. They were probably with the church and the temple every day, but literally their intentions weren't bad. But if they didn't do what God told them to do, then their good intentions wouldn't have mattered. Like 
Something that you need to know, our well-intent obedience is still disobedience. Come on, I need to say that one again. Our well intent of obedience is still disobedience. We can't cover it up. We can't sugarcoat it. We can't form it to fit us. We can't form it to fit our comfort. And we, as an American culture, we like our comfort. <laughs> I mean, amen. <laughs> I like my comfort. <laughs> But God usually is calling us in a place of obedience because there's something in that. Literally, Moses is in the presence of God at the burning bush. And what does God first do? He says, take off your shoes for you're standing on holy ground. How silly is that? To take off this, this man-made cloth off of your feet, why? Because God knew if he steps into my presence in obedience, I can do something. And so how you start this thing matters. That first lap matters. You know, me, uh, me, and, me and my wife never work out together. We work out separately. And for whatever reason, it's just not our flow. It's just not our thing. I like to put my AirPods in. I like to do my own thing, listen to my, my, my podcast. I don't want to have a conversation with anyone. I don't want to talk to anyone. I just want to be like locked in. And honestly, it's probably because it, it does something mentally for me. It's just like mentally like regizing me or something. I don't know. Um, so we never, we never work out. But there was this one time we were sitting at home and we decided to take a run together. And I've always been so afraid to take a run with her because she's more athletic than me and she's probably faster than me. <laughs> and to me as a man, that takes a hit to my pride. And so when we decided to take a run, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go so fast. <laughs> she is gonna get so tired. She's gonna be so impressed and it's gonna be a good night. <laughs> but what ended up happening is we, we, we started running and I just, I just took off. <laughs> and like, she was only gonna run a mile. I was only gonna run 45 minutes. And so she, by the time she reached her mile, she just kind of turned around and I kept going. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I felt so good. My intentions were good too. I just wanted to impress her. I just wanted to, well, maybe they weren't the best because there's probably full of other stuff. Anyways, it was all good. My intentions were probably good. But what, up, what, what ended up happening, literally she turned back and then I just, I don't know what happened. I started cramping like in my back. My back, my whole back like seized up and my breathing was like, <clears throat> like, it was like, it was like, I can't explain it. It was so embarrassing. I, when I was running in my neighborhood, I had to stop and do this thing. And like, uh, it was like, you know, like if you ever got your wind knocked out of you, like that type of breathing, it was so embarrassing. And I was like, dude, I am done. I could, I could barely, I had to like, I was like, she's gonna have to come pick me up. I can't even walk. And, and like, it's just, but the thing is like, I was trying to do this thing in my own strength and my own capability and my own thing. And what happens is my intent was good, but like it, it, wasn't, it wasn't what I should have been doing. And a lot of us can approach our Jericho the same way. We can be amped up. We can be ready to go. We can charge the castle. We can charge the gate. And then we hit this wall and we're wondering why we can't move. And I love that Joshua is saying, hey, we gotta be obedient. I'm here to like stress a point to you. Obedience matters. Obedience is vital. We have to be obedient because there's so many characteristics of God that we can learn from just being obedient. It's like this heart posture that matters. Point number two, there's always grace heading into the sixth lap. Come on, this one's good. There's always grace heading into the sixth lap. I love that the meanings of numbers in the Bible symbolize something. Does anyone, is anyone like, kind of like into that? Yeah, like looking up at the numbers and like, what do they mean? And you know, my wife loves that stuff. I'm like, yeah, it looks, it's cool. Like, it's great. <laughs> but then I, I got into this and I'm like, wow, this is so good. So I want to explain a few numbers. Uh, number six, the number six and the meaning is related to man and human weakness, the evils of the devil and the manifestation of sin. It's pretty heavy. Every time we see, every, now, every time I see the number six, I'm like, ooh. It's like this thing of man and human weakness. And I think the sixth lap in my mind represents us at our weakest. 
We can be running this thing, believing God for breakthrough in this area. And then we hit this sixth lap and it's like, we're so tired. We're so drained spiritually, emotionally, physically. We could be just so drained. And, and, and it's like this, we're at our weakest. And I think you need to hold on to this. We're at our weakest. But I love what num the number five represents. Five is symbolized for grace, goodness, and favor towards humans. And what I found in my life, usually before I hit this sixth lap or the sixth season or whatever it is, I always feel like there's a season where God teaches me about his grace or he reveals to me attributes of his goodness, his kindness. There's usually a season before you head into that sixth lap where God is literally giving you revelation on his grace. And let me tell you, that is so like, I'm not saying he does that every time, but in my experience, as I look back at my life, I can see, man, there was a season where I was like, it was hard. It was, it was really hard and I was at my weakest. But then I look back and remember, man, you remember, Remember that season where God was gracing me, where he was teaching me the power of grace, where he was teaching me of his goodness and teaching me of, about who he is? Because what happens is we, we need that because when we're heading into the sixth lap, when we're tired and at our weakness, the, the enemy knows that. What happens is he usually attacks us when we're at our weakness. But then we can literally look back and say, no, 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 no. You don't know. It's not by my strength, but it's by his strength that this thing is done. It's not by my goodness, but it's by his. He usually sets us up before that sixth season, teaches us it's his grace. He's the one that fills us full of strength. It's his grace that sustains us. We can find strength in him. There's usually a season, a circumstance, a relationship that is testing you, looking at you, and giving you a new revelation of grace. And so I'm here to tell you, don't just like be intentional in that season. If you feel like the Lord is teaching you about his grace, teaching you about his goodness, his kindness, lean into that because it's vital for that sixth lap. You need something to hold on to. You need something for, for, for that to, to propel you through that thing. God can only sustain us. In Joshua 6, uh, uh, verse 11, it says this. So he had the ark of the Lord, carried it around the city, circled it once. Then the army returned to the camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear uh, guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once, returned to camp, and they did this for six days. This, we're literally reading the process God laid out and it being fulfilled. We're reading this thing, how God instructed it and it's being fulfilled. And what I think that the Lord was trying to teach the Israelites, because this is a lot of stuff. There's a lot of process happening. They can't just do what they want. They're actually living in this obedience. They're, they're in this thing. What I think he's trying to teach them is how to wait on him how to wait on God. And let me tell you, us as a church, as a body of believers, we have to be a people who first and get a fresh revelation of what it means to wait on God to wait on him, to be filled with his presence, to know what it is like to wait on God. Because you can read in this scripture, the Israelites were, were waiting on him. And, and something else too, like waiting on God isn't just doing nothing. Waiting isn't just a stagnant thing. Waiting is a verb. It is an action that we do. And so a lot of us want to wait on the Lord and we just think, oh yeah, I'm just not going to come to church. And oh, hey man, why weren't you at church? Oh, I was waiting on the God. I was waiting on the Lord. I, I had someone say that to me once. And I was like, okay, guy, whatever. But like... Waiting on the Lord is an active thing. You even see this in the scripture we just read. What were the Israelites doing? They were marching, they were camping, and then they would wait. They marched, they camped, and then they wait. And we have to be a people that know what it's like to wait on the Lord. And waiting on the Lord, what that looks like practically for us, every time, I mean, gosh, I am in this season right now. I am in this season of just 
needing to wait on the Lord. And when I find, when I'm in that season, that I need to kick my pursuit of the Lord into overdrive. That's what it means to wait on him. It's to pursue him without any restrictions. You're just going, you're, you're hearing from the Lord. You're in his presence. You're in him. You're, you're literally hearing his voice. You know, I have a friend that calls me. We stay in touch. He lives in Jersey and uh, we're, we're best friends. We did ministry together for a long time. And he called me the other day and we always call just to talk about, you know, marriage and family and everything else in between and coffee. We're really into coffee. And so he calls me, he's like, hey man, how are you doing? And I was like, man, to be honest, like I'm really tired. I'm really like, I'm exhausted. Like we as a church just came out of the busiest summer ever. You know, we had amazing things happen, incredible things happen in July, but man, July, I'm spent. Emotionally, I'm like unstable. <laughs> you know, I need, I, need, I need the Lord right now. I'm, I'm, I'm physically just beat. And he said something to me that didn't register at the time, but he said, those who wait upon, the, like he said, Blake, what does the Bible say? Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And immediately I said, oh yeah, dude, that's good. That's good. Come on. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't think anything of it. I was working on my, my sermon that same day and man, I was just wrestling. I was wrestling with being tired. I was wrestling with like, man, what does the Lord want to speak? And I go out to the cafe and we have a, some of our facilities people out there uh, just taking a break uh, by the coffee place. And um, and Stephen was out there and some others, I can't remember, but I get my coffee and Stephen looks at me. <laughs> he goes, man, Blake, I was telling Cammie, uh, man, Blake looks real tired. <laughs> and I was like, dude, I am tired. I'm really tired. I, I feel so scrambled. Man, I have like, I have graphic requests that I can't even get my mind around. I have all this list of work that I can't even, for whatever reason, everything is blurry. It feels chaos. And I was like, yeah, but you know, it's just a season. It'll be, it's okay. It's always busy season. It's how it is. And then I walked away and I just felt an impression of the Holy Spirit. And he said, hey, Blake, how do you renew your strength? Those who wait on the Lord shall renew your strength. And I love the Holy Spirit. I love that he convicts us so gently, that he's so kind. And in that moment, I was like, Lord, I, I, I had to repent because I was just running and I was just, I was, I was just going and I, I, I went back and I actually was writing my message in the translation room because I know no one would find me. <laughs> and I just, I just went in there and I just waited. I waited on the Lord and I didn't write another thing on my sermon. <laughs> I just waited and just was in his presence and I just began to pursue him. I began to read Psalms 119 and begin to praise him. Lord, thank you, Lord, that what is established in heaven is firm. It is not fragile. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you are constant in my life. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you've been looking out for me ever since I was a young boy. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you are near to me. You're near to this moment. Lord, thank you for your presence. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Lord, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are ever everything that I need. Lord, you are here. Thank you for your presence. And then something just begin, I just begin to get stirred up. I just begin to get stirred up and there was no agenda. There was no agenda of producing anything, but the agenda of just being with my father, being with him in his presence. This is what we have to learn church, that we have to learn to learn how to wait on him. We have to learn to take this thing and just be in his presence. And this is what Joshua is trying to teach. I feel like this is what the Lord was trying to teach the people of Israel. Hey, I've given you everything that you need to wait on me. A lot of us are, are so, so far away from the will of God because we're living in disobedience and all the time people are coming up like, I can't hear his voice. How can I obey him if I can't hear his voice? One of the most frequent questions I get, especially from young people, is like, Blake, how do I hear from the Lord? How do I hear the voice of God? And literally the Lord has equipped us for this. What does he give us? The Bible. You want to hear from the, you want to hear the voice of God? Read your Bible. Is God inspired? It doesn't have to be this spiritual thing. It it doesn't have to be this deep. You can hear, everyone in this room can hear from God. Read your Bible. He's equipped us. So if you want to be aligned with the things of heaven, be in accordance, in obedience. If you want to obey the Lord, you can hear his voice. Get in the word. He's given us these steps. And so he's given the Israelites the steps to do this. And now he's teaching them to wait on me, to wait in his presence. Is that good? 
Isn't he so good? Isn't he so kind? Thank you, Lord. And point number three, this is the good one. I like this one. This is my favorite one. (laughs) The breakthrough is in the seventh lap, but the fruit is in the sixth. The breakthrough is in the seventh lap, but the fruit is in the sixth. Verse 15, on the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is in it are are to be devoted to the Lord. Here comes the breakthrough. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, uh, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. I love breakthrough. Anyone else love breakthrough? Anyone, has anyone, can someone testify and just like, has God broken through in your life in some way? Just raise your hand. If he's broken through, someone needs to look around. Look at all this breakthrough. If you're needing breakthrough, look what God is already doing in these people's lives. He's already broken through. I love breakthrough. Breakthrough is necessary. We need breakthrough in our freedom. We need breakthrough in our churches. God, we need breakthrough in our high schools, in our colleges, in our middle schools. We need breakthrough in our nation. We need breakthrough in our marriages, in our families. In our, we need breakthrough. Don't get me wrong. We need the breakthrough. The breakthrough is important. But there's something that happens On this journey, there's fruit that's being produced that if you're not careful, you can miss it. We can long, we can almost put breakthrough on this pedestal and look at it and idealize it and like I just need him to break through. But what God is doing leading up to it is so much important. He's literally producing fruit in you in this this run, in this Jericho, whatever your Jericho is, he's producing something that is going to sustain you so that when your breakthrough does happen, you can't bring that break that breakthrough happens once you can literally bring this fruit that that this fruit that you gained all the way up to the breakthrough and take it to the next season you'll have this fruit forever there's an anointing that is being released on this on the way to the breakthrough people just want to get there they're missing the anointing and the fruit and the grace and the faithfulness that God is trying to show them I'm telling you, the breakthrough's in the seventh, but the fruit is in the sixth. We gotta be a people who love fruit. (laughs) We gotta be people who are obsessed with what God's doing on the journey. That fruit is vital. The fruit of this, it's in the sixth lap. Someone needs to know, this is someone's second wind. Someone has felt defeated. Someone has felt deflated. Someone in this room feels bored. This is your second win. What's the fruit that he's, he's producing in you right now? What is the fruit that's being produced? Is it good fruit or is it bad fruit? Because how are we, how we respond during this journey matters. It can produce a fruit that we don't want. If the Israelites were disobedient and they did things their own way and they, did, and they missed things, that would have produced a fruit that they didn't want. And so right now in this moment, in your notes, you can even ask, what's being produced in me in this season? And be real with yourself. Is it godly fruit or is this fruit from something that I don't want? But I truly believe that there's an anointing that we get in season of struggle. There's, there, there, man, I just think, man, I have friends. I had a friend in, in, in New Jersey <laughs> who lost her dad. And like this grieving process happens. And maybe someone in here is grieving right now. I'm telling you in that season of grief, there's a grace, there's a comfort, but there's also, there's an anointing that you can't get. And so I think there's these things in the sixth lap that produce fruit that we need to be patient on. We need to what? We need to wait on the Lord. 
And someone in this room, you feel defeated. You feel like it's game over, that you have no hope, that you have, you have nothing left in the tank, that it's, that it's it, this is it. I'm not gonna see the breakthrough. God is super distant from me. He doesn't care about me. But I'm here to tell you, this is your second wind. I feel like the Holy Spirit is even saying this and nudging this right now. This is your second wind, that the Holy Spirit isn't distant from you. He's involved in everything that you are. He is not gone, but he is near to you. This is time for you to rise up. Do not be discouraged, but be encouraged because he's in the first lap. He's in the second lap. He's surely gonna be in the third lap. He's in the fourth one. You just got to keep camping and marching, camping and marching. You got to march and you got to camp and then you got to wait. You got to march, then you got to camp and then you got to wait. So I'm here to tell you, church, don't give up. Your marriage can't afford it. Your relationships, your businesses can't afford it. Don't give up. Stay in the race. Stay in the story. God has a purpose for you. He has a plan for your life, and it's going to impact your family, your business. So don't give up. It may be the sixth lap. You might be at your weakest, but there is something that God is producing that in you that you can carry on to the seventh. Your breakthrough is there. God is already working in you, so don't just wait for the breakthrough. We're going to praise him before the breakthrough. Come on. You can't give up. This is for you. This is your second wind. It's time for a second wind. For the church in whole, it's time for a second wind. For this nation, it is time for a second wind a wind of revival. It's time. I feel it in my spirit. Can we do something? Can we just bow our heads and close our eyes? Come on, his presence is here. <laughs> his presence is here. Holy Spirit, lead us. If you're in this room and you feel like you, this message spoke to you in any way, if you feel like, man, before you walked in here, you were thinking about hanging it up, if you feel like you've been tired, if you feel like you've been beaten down, if you feel like this thing, if that's you, if you need a second wind, if you need that pick me up, if you need the Holy Spirit to come and intervene, if you need the Holy Spirit to remind you what fruit he's doing, if you need the Holy Spirit to remind you what exactly he's, he, he's doing in this season, if that's you, if you need that second wind, can you just boldly lift your hand? and say, that's me. Come on, all across the room, there's hands. Just lift your hand, don't be shy. Come on, your breakthrough is here. Come on, yes, all across this room. All across this room, there needs to be a second wind. Holy Spirit, right now we pray. Holy Spirit, that you would blow through this place. Holy Spirit, that you would fill us up with your spirit. Lord, that you would fill us up with encouragement of truth. Lord, that there, the enemy, no scheme of the enemy will prosper. But Lord, you are lifting these people up. Lord, I pray right now for every hand that's lifted up, that you would begin to stir up their hearts again. Lord, that their passions are coming back to life. They're remembering the vision that you've given them. Lord, that it's literally raising back to life. Holy Spirit, revive us in this moment right now. We say we need you. We're in our sixth lap. We're tired and we're weak, but Lord, we know that you're good. We know that you're faithful. We know that your grace goes before us. And so Lord, right now, revive us. Holy Spirit, refresh our spirit. Let a Fresh anointing begin to flow over us. In Jesus' name. And then there's some of us in this room that doesn't even know God. Or maybe you made a decision back when you were like a baby and you didn't really make that decision. It was kind of made for you. <laughs> or maybe you made that decision, but man, you're so far from God. You know you need to repent. You know you need to come back to him. If that's you, with every eye closed, if that's you, just lift your hand in boldness. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. Yeah, I see that hand back. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just a little longer. If that's you, it's not too late. 
I just want to invite the prayer team back up, up to the front. And we're going to close this service and response. Let me tell you something. It's not over. The service isn't over. We still have, to, we still have a response. And so I think it's so easy to lift our hands and say we need a second wind. But I'm here to tell you, let's seal that thing today. Come up here and get prayer. Come up here and let's, let's do this thing together. I'm telling you, you'll never regret getting prayer. <laughs> but you sometimes might regret not getting it. <laughs> There's been times in my life where I regret that. So these people are awesome. They want to pray with you. Don't leave this place with questions. Don't leave this place not being prayed for. Your second win starts now. How you start it, it matters. So if the Holy Spirit is calling you up here to get prayer, be obedient to that. Come get prayer. So come on, can we stand on our feet? And we're going to press in. We're going to lean into worship right now. The temptation is to not lean in. The temptation is just kind of wait till the service goes over. But come on, can we press in? Can we just give him praise right now? Can we press in? Come on. Come on. There's a second win happening. Come on.